My name is Nicholas Rowe. I am Ward Law Professor of English Literature at the University of St Andrews and I'm also a Fellow of the British Academy. 2021 marks the bicentenary of the death of the English Romantic poet John Keats at Rome on the 23rd of February 1821. Over the years I've been fortunate to have many conversations about Keats with undergraduate and postgraduate students and I have also edited and written a number of books about the poet. My biography, John Keats, A New Life, appeared in 2012 and since then I've continued researching into John Keats, focusing in particular on how his reputation evolved after his death and across the decades leading up to the publication in August of 1848 of the first biography, Richard Monckton Milnes's Life, Letters and Literary Remains of John Keats. This pioneering biography did much to set the seal on Keats's reputation. And in the next few minutes, I want to take you back to the beginning of the story, in the hours and days and weeks immediately following the poet's death at Rome. Keats was suffering from pulmonary tuberculosis when in September of 1820 he left London to pass the winter in the milder climate at Rome. In Rome Keats was accompanied by Joseph Severn, the painter, and by February of 1821 Severn had been exhausted by long days and sleepless nights of looking after the poet. Late in the evening on the 23rd of February, Severn was at the bedside when John Keats died. Not surprisingly, he was shattered and distraught at the experience he'd been through, and it took him some days before he was able to collect himself sufficiently to write a letter to Keats's friends back in London to tell them the news. It was on Tuesday the 27th of February that Severn put pen to paper and began a letter to Charles Armitage Brown. Brown had been Keats, Keats's friend, and it was with Brown that Keats had lodged at Wentworth Place in Hampstead. It's now called Keats House, of course. It was with Brown that Keats had walked around Scotland in the summer of 1818 and it was with Brown that Keats had collaborated on the composition of their tragedy Otto the Great in the summer of 1819. Severn's letter to Brown took some 18 days in the post before it arrived at Hampstead and was delivered on the evening of Saturday the 17th of March to Wentworth Place. Brown knew very well what the outcome of pulmonary tuberculosis was likely to be and at some level I think he was expecting the news but when Severn's letter was delivered and he opened it and read the contents he was profoundly shocked. Brown waited overnight and then on the Sunday morning he did what he knew had to be done. He went next door at Wentworth Place and told Fanny Braun, who had been Keats's fiance, that John Keats had died. Brown went back to his rooms at the other side of Wentworth Place and he sat down and he began a series of letters to Keats's friends. And the last of these letters he sent off to Keats's publisher, John Taylor. It was Taylor who had published Keats's poetic romance Endymion back in April of 1818 and more recently it was Taylor who had published Keats's third and last and greatest collection of poetry Lamia, Isabella, The Eve of St Agnes and other poems. That book had appeared in June of 1820 a matter of weeks before Keats had left London. In his letter to Taylor, 
Brown included a request. He asked Taylor to place a notice in the London newspapers that would announce uh, Keats's death, and Taylor did as he, as he had been asked. On Thursday the 22nd of March, the Morning Chronicle carried this announcement. At Rome, on the 23rd of February, of a decline, John Keats, the poet, aged 25. Now, Taylor had evidently placed several other announcements in the papers that day. It appeared also in the New Times and in the Sun, and in the evening in the Star newspaper. As was the usual publishing practice at the time, other London newspapers picked up on the announcement and republished it in the days and weeks following. As many as 34 London newspapers in all published the news, and of course the provincial papers followed. I've been able to identify around a dozen provincial newspapers that also carried the news. They were published in Canterbury and Newcastle, in Bath and in Edinburgh, and as far north as Inverness, where the Inverness Courier carried the news. It was published in newspapers in Bristol and Belfast, and in Liverpool and Hull, and in Bury and in Stamford. Some of these uh, announcements followed Taylor's original wording in the Morning Chronicle. Others adopted Hunt's different wording as published in his Examiner newspaper. Some of the announcements included references to Keats's poetry, particularly Endymion, and one of them, the announcement placed in the Stamford Mercury, had been placed by a personal acquaintance of Keats. Drawing all of these publications together, it's apparent that by the 8th of April, that's some three weeks, I suppose, after the original appearance of the announcement in the, in the Morning Chronicle, the news had appeared across the length and breadth of the country in some 56 newspapers. In a word, the news of Keats's death had gone nationwide. Now, it's usually assumed that Keats's reputation, which had been modest during his lifetime, underwent a steep decline immediately following his death, and that it took some three decades until a revival began in the 1840s with the publication of William Smith's little selected editions of Keats's poems published in 1840 and 1841. The Pre-Raphaelite painters also took Keats's poems as subjects for their paintings, and late in the decade, as I've said already, Richard Monckton Milnes published his pioneering biography. In the 1820s there had of course been some tribute poems, some by people who knew Keats's poetry, others by poets who had known Keats in person. Shelley had published his remarkable elegy, Adonais, at Pisa in 1821, and it had been republished in England at Cambridge in 1829, the year that also saw the publication at Paris of Galignani's collection of the poems of Coleridge, Shelley and Keats. What I want to suggest that the received account of how Keats's reputation developed in these posthumous years needs reassessing in the light of the nationwide announcement of his death in papers immediately following the uh, first announcement in the Morning Chronicle on the 22nd of March. It seems to me that there was a kind of seedbed being laid down in popular consciousness and public awareness that a poet named John Keats had existed 
and that he had died at Rome, aged 25. It seems to me that the story needs to be investigated again and told anew. In the few moments that I've had today, I've only been able to give you the beginnings of that story, of how Keats's reputation evolved, and I hope to go on to tell a new story at greater length in the future. Thank you for listening to this short talk about John Keats in the bicentenary year of his death.